Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, June 4th, 2015. Here's a quick look what's coming up. Tonight, VA workers tell all over drinks. Then, the new scheme to disarm America. And U.S. officials say that ISIS has teamed with Assad. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times. Ah. Stick a fork in us, we're done. Since the beginning of the so-called civil war in Syria, the Obama administration has armed, funded, and trained radical jihadists as a tool to overthrow Syria's president, Bashir al-Assad. This is how ISIS was created by Western intelligence to destabilize the region and send in a U.S.-led coalition for a good old-fashioned regime change. And this is something we've known about for a very long time, from Zygmunt Brzezinski's grand chessboard to the PNAC documents. Syria has been on the U.S. target list, or at least targeted by the U.S. military-industrial complex, who now runs the show. And don't forget, it was like eight years ago that four-star General Wesley Clark, he said that the U.S. planned to overthrow Syria a long time ago. We're talking all the way back, as far back as 2001, shortly after 9-11. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. So the current course of events in the Middle East predetermined by the United States. And as it turns out, the war against ISIS, well, it's not exactly what the establishment media or the Obama administration, for that matter, it's not what they make it out to be. This has been a long and thought out plan, even before Obama ever took office. And once again, this is to destabilize the region in Syria and then go on in, in there and take it over militarily. I mean, this is right out of the CIA's playbook on regime changes, complete with America's role as puppet master. But I am proposing that you will be giving arms to the side that is fighting against Assad that has elements of al-Qaeda. There is a great irony there. I am also saying that in your rush to get involved in Syria, that you may well be arming Islamic rebels who will be shooting Christians. It's hard to argue that the Syrian rebels that you will be arming are not associated forces of al-Qaeda. Are they not fighting on the same side of a war? Can you argue there's no connection between them, that really this is a three-way war? I know that's the way we're trying to break it down. I don't think it's that easy to say that. I think it's impossible to say that the Syrian rebels are not associated with al-Qaeda. So there is a great irony that you will be arming forces that... A, a normal common sense use of the word associated can say that these people are associated with al-Qaeda. That's all. Thank you. Well, Rand Paul certainly knows what's going on. And, you know, it, it's one thing to speculate, but we've got hardcore proof. All right. The information is everywhere outside the mainstream media anyway. And recently, Judicial Watch, they obtained a host of secret U.S. government documents through a federal lawsuit. And it shows Western governments deliberately allied with al-Qaeda and other Islamist extremist groups to topple Syrian President Bashir al-Assad. And it goes on to say that the West intentionally sponsored violent Islamist groups to destabilize Assad, despite anticipating that doing so could lead to the emergence 
of an Islamic state in Iraq and in Syria. In Zero Hedge, they wrote a detailed article on all this. Secret Pentagon report reveals U.S. created ISIS as a tool to overthrow Syria's President Assad. And this confirms everything that we've been saying for a long time. And look, Russia, China, and Iran, they all support Syria's President Bashir al-Assad. And they know exactly what the U.S. government is doing right now. So this is a very dangerous game we are playing. Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, well, he says that they know that the U.S. is using ISIS as a pretext for bombing Syria. And he warns that such a development could lead to a huge escalation of conflict in the Middle East. Well, you could say that again. And now U.S. officials from the embassy in Syria, they are claiming via Twitter that the Syrian government is aiding ISIS. And of course, we know that that's a bunch of BS. Don't believe the hype. ISIS is a Frankenstein created, funded, and supported by the U.S. government and Saudi Arabia, our partners in crime. Well, it looks like the Justice Department wants to ban more Americans from owning firearms. That's right. Barack Hussein Obama is proposing new firearm regulations that will flat out revoke gun rights for those the federal government declares to be mentally unfit. And that's a scary thought considering the fact that the official diagnostic system for mental disorders in the U.S., the DSM-5, it is so broad that almost every form of human behavior can be diagnosed as some type of mental illness. And don't forget it was back in 2012, so not very long ago, that the D Department of Veteran Affairs, they actually sent out letters to U.S. military veterans informing them that their competence levels were under review. And if the federal government rated them incompetent, they would be prohibited from purchasing, possessing, receiving, or transporting a firearm or even ammunition. And they weren't screwing around either because lots of veterans lost their God-given right to self-defense as the Second Amendment was completely trampled on by the Obama administration. So everybody who's a veteran, here's the article, federal government moves to disarm veterans. They're all getting a letter saying that we will order you to relinquish your guns or we'll send police to take your guns, no judge or jury. And physical reasons, they're now taking veterans' kids if your leg's blown off. Okay, and there's the letter notice if you're watching us on InfoWars News at PrisonPlanet.tv. Going to Mr. Schmecker, here's the headline. Veterans' guns confiscated after forced psychiatric evaluation. Purge against arms ex-servicemen accelerates. And so just briefly, tell us the story of what happened to you uh, what precipitated it and where your guns are now and how they're charging you for the uh, days you were held at the hospital. Uh, David Schmecker, thank you for joining us. Yes, no problem. Yes, they, I got requested to see a pain management specialist and the, the, they came back to me, the Veterans Administration came back to me and uh, said that you have to see a half hour of a psychiatrist and a half hour of a psychologist for a spine injury. And I uh, refuse to do that because I have a spine injury. I don't really, you know, I don't want to see, especially not a veteran's hospital psychiatrist. Yeah, so I refused, and uh, six months later, uh, basically the hospital, my, my primary care physician called to have a wellness check uh, uh, placed on me, and the local police perform a wellness check. Well, the local police came up, and there was nothing wrong with me. I had no, um, you know... There was no anxiety. I wasn't uh, combative. Uh, I basically, but I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't with anybody, so I had no witnesses. And they didn't have a warrant. And they, uh, in, with through intimidation, forcefully uh, commandeered my vehicle and entered my home, searched and seized my weapons, and um, then, you know, carted me away in an ambulance to. Uh, 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 psychiatric evaluation, which I was held for 72 hours. So there's a good example of what started back in 2012 targeting veterans. Now they want to test all of our competence levels. 
to see whether or not we are responsible enough to protect ourselves and protect our very own families. And other proposed regulations include, get this, they want, they want rules on where our firearms are stored and how they are stored in our very own homes. Man, I tell you what, and there will even be uh, new restrictions on what they determine to be high power pistols. Whatever the hell that is, uh, it should be interesting. That's their words, not mine, high power pistols. So that should be an interesting list indeed. And of course, we learned to expect all this from the Obama regime, even though he originally campaigned against it. When y'all go home and you're talking to your buddies and they say, ah, oh, he wants to take my gun away. You've heard it here. I'm on television, so everybody knows it. I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe in people's lawful right to bear arms. I will not take your shotgun away. I will not take your rifle away. I won't take your handgun away. Wait a minute. Was that evidence of a corrupt politician breaking a campaign promise? I mean, that, that never happens. Read my lips. No. Yeah, and if you think a Republican president is going to jump in and repeal all this in 2016, think again, because it ain't happening. You know, I, I'll be the first to tell you that I know none of this is happening overnight, but it is indeed happening. The globalists want America unarmed. They want us castrated. So gun confiscation is happening. They're off to a good start, and they're doing a little song and dance. This is what I call the two steps forward one step back routine, and here's how it works. The Obama administration introduces ridiculous and outrageous gun restrictions that inspire outrage all across the country, two steps forward. Then Obama backs away from the plan while trying to preserve as much of the plan as possible. This is a tactical withdrawal, one step back, and of course that equals one step closer to total gun confiscation. You see, there's always portions of the gun restrictions that survive the public's backlash. And if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's very clever. This is how they make progress, and this is how they take away our guns. For example, they may not succeed in banning AR-15 ammo, all right? But what they do is, is other measures will be pushed through. And then the Democrats come back with a compromise. And they tell everyone, hey, let's be reasonable. Let's meet halfway on this issue. And that's how it's done. Meanwhile, they launch a massive propaganda campaign through movies and television trying to convince you that gun owners are bad, not to mention very dangerous. Part of every day, some kind of anti-violence, anti-gun message. Every day, every school, at every level. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. It's not enough to simply have a, a catchy ad on a Monday and then only do it every Monday. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. That's right. And it was Attorney General Eric Holder who said they were talking about plans of making us gun owners wear electronic bracelets. Remember that? Vice President Biden and I had um, a meeting with a group of technology people and talked about how um, guns can be made more safe by making them either through fingerprint identification, um, the gun talks to a, a bracelet or something that you might wear, um, how guns can be used only by the person who is uh, lawfully in um, possession of, of the weapon. Wow. And they want us to have psychological evaluations. I tell you what, that guy's crazy right there. There's no way I'm ever wearing an electronic bracelet. And as long as we're playing Eric Holder clips, might as well throw in a Dianne Feinstein while you're at it. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. I would have done it. From my cold, dead hands, Feinstein. And remember, this is all going on while at the same time, the federal government and the Department of Homeland Security, they are stockpiling massive amounts of weapons and ammunition. While at the same time, they are declaring publicly that the number one domestic threat to our country is returning veterans. 
And one way to restrict veterans from owning firearms, well, that is to get them addicted to pharmaceutical drugs. In the latest video released from Project Veritas, they discovered that that's exactly what's going on right now with our nation's veterans. Many of them are becoming drug addicts thanks to the good old VA. They create, they create drug addicts. In my opinion, they create a drug addict. The VA does push pills. It's sick care, not health care. Is the overprescription thing like common with the with the VA? It's common in the whole country. And with me now is returning veteran Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. What's your reaction to the video? And, and I want to get your reaction also to the VA pushing these dangerous drugs on veterans. Well, like you said earlier, if the VA is not trying to disarm you so you can't protect yourself and you get killed that way, they're going to try to prescribe you these pills. So in essence, you just go out and you kill yourself. And that's what's happening. You know, in the past two and a half months, I've lost two of my Army buddies to suicide due to overprescription. And now we have this new James O'Keefe video out from Projects Veritas saying that the VA members are basically turning veterans into drug addicts. And he had the opportunity to speak to doctors, nurses, contract workers, uh, senior volunteers, that's all said that they were pushing pills and it's part of the, the agenda going on there at the VA. I mean, this is something that we've been talking about for quite some time as one of the problems that they push pills, but they do not get to the root of the problem. And that's one of the things many of the people in the video said that, hey, we're not allowed to get to the root of the problem. We're just gonna keep prescribing you one pill after another, and eventually it'll work or you end up killing yourself. Yeah, and it's a very revealing video, hidden camera. I, I love uh, the, the work Project Veritas does. And we also know that there is an epidemic of military suicides right now. Some estimate as many as 22 suicides per day. Mm -hmm. And we also know that most of the pharmaceutical drugs that are being prescri uh, prescribed by the VA, you know, it could lead to suicide like we're saying. So it's a very dangerous combo. Yeah, it's Oxycontin, morphine, Dilaudid, Percocet. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, they used to give me 50 sheets of Percocet a week. Usually when you're deployed or if you get hurt sometime, you know, here back in civilian life, you might get 90 Percocet to last you 90 days. They were giving us 50 a week. And then when we came back uh, about a month before we'd come back, we'd move to another base and we're getting ready to like, you know, kind of like desensitize and go through briefings. Like, hey, you're going back to the real world. They go, hey, you know, by the way, I know you guys are kind of addicted to these uh, pills, but we have to, you have to stop now, cold turkey. And once you get back, if you take a urine test and you still have that in your system, we will kick you out. And that's a lot of things that are happening. That's how they get veterans when they get out. They get them addicted to these drugs and then they turn their back on them. They don't get to the root of the problem and they end up in mental institutes. They end up killing themselves or they just go plain crazy and go on some kind of, you know, it's just out of this world. The fact that we can't get any kind of health care for these guys. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and my thing is, too, is we're learning that it could also lead to gun confiscation because a sure way to get your guns taken away or a sure way to fail the DSM-5 psychological evaluation is to be on these prescription drugs for anxiety, uh, for for depression, or for PS, uh, PTSD. I mean, I mean, I'll be real with you right now. There's been many times where right when I was getting out, I was going through the VA process to enter mm -hmm. and I spoke with psychologists and all that because I have diagnosed PTSD and yes. have all these different things and they pushed all these pills and there were many times where I was sitting there with a gun in my mouth mm -hmm. with no other way of knowing what to do and you would have these mental breakdowns. I would be driving down the road and at a stoplight start screaming and tears coming out not knowing why I was so angry and I'd be punching the roof of my car. That's the effect those drugs have. The time that I finally realized that that was the cause of my problems and that it could be treated another way, I went home, I flushed all that stuff down the toilet that's been almost two years and I have not had a breakdown like that. I haven't had any kind of uh, depressing thoughts, no suicidal things like that whatsoever. Those drugs will kill you. Yeah, they do lead to suicide and we've seen that not just in veterans but in the general public as well. And I'm just thinking what a tragedy it is that 
someone that is suffering from depression, needs counseling, needs someone to talk to, but they might be afraid to approach anyone because if they do so, they might have their guns taken away or they might be prescribed these dangerous drugs. Which will get them taken away then too. Absolutely. So it's a lose-lose situation for our returning vets here in America. All right, Joe Biggs, thanks for staying on top of all this. It's good to have you on our side. Hey, look, we're going to take a quick break right now. The InfoWars Nightly News will return right after this message to all you Bush supporters out there. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. We are joined right now by our news director, Rob Dew, and you have some Sandy Hook updates for us right now. I understand this is the second Freedom of Information Act hearing on Sandy Hook, right. yet they still refuse to release the documents that were requested by Wolfgang Halbig. What's going on? Well, it seems to be a lot of the, uh, I, I guess, the, the strategy they're using is saying doc documents don't exist. So there's porta potties that are there, but there's no documents of the city ordering them or paying for them. All right. There's an electronic sign there that says everybody must check in, yet there's no check-in log. So if there's a sign flashing that says everybody must check in, you would think there would be a check-in log where people are checking in. Does that make sense? Kind of makes sense to me. Okay. Why you would bring a giant road sign there that says everybody must check in and then not have a log stating who checked in. Agreed. Mm -hmm. All right. So who put that sign there? Who paid for that? Well, yesterday during the hearing, it came out, they had one of the, uh, the town, they call them the selectman, is actually an older uh, lady. And she says, we don't have any of that information at all. And so the lawyer goes, well, who put that sign up there? She goes, well, Homeland Security, I think. She actually said it was Homeland Security. So then that is a bigger ball of wax to get and into. What time did they first notice the sign? Because the tragedy, what, occurred, what, 1030 in the morning? Uh, yeah, early right. in the morning, 10-ish, 10, okay. 10, 10, 15, 1030. Um, the first thing that I've seen, and there's probably other videos of this sign out there, but is when... Um, the older gentleman, Gene Rosen, is being interviewed by Fox News at 2.30, and there's a sign back there flashing okay. saying that uh, everyone must check in. And we've, we showed that with the last clips of Sandy Hook footage uh, that we put out from the first hearing. And so Wolfgang's stance is that so these things don't just appear by themselves. There sure. has to be paper, a paper trail. And he would nothing, know he's an expert on all this. Right. He's a school safety expert. He's, he was an administrator yeah. uh, for many years. And, and then the other... Uh, deal is with these kids going on a field trip to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. There has to be an approval for that. Uh, my kids can't get on a bus to go across town here locally unless there's a permission slip. And it's like that nationwide. It, that's how schools are. Yep. That's how schools are run. So for the, for the school district to say we don't have permission slips for kids going on a trip, well, that means one of two things. Either they decided not to get permission slips for kids, which violates all kind of liability laws. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be transporting kids without permission slips, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, or maybe those kids weren't actually from Sandy Hook. That could be the other thing. And then there's this whole ruse of how is the mainstream media saying these kids are from Sandy Hook? They're here in the Super Bowl singing. How do you get there? If you know, How does that work? That just but, is like yeah. blows my mind. But a lot of this, these that. are basic questions right. that, that aren't being answered and it's like why all the secrecy and it yeah, just it exactly. makes it sound very it, odd if you want it to go away and you're sick of people bringing it up then give them the documents sure, they ask sure. for and, and move on with your life so actually let's just go to the clip here of the town select woman saying that homeland security put it up here right. it is directing your attention please to request number eight is for the sign-in log referred to on the traffic sign posted outside the sandy hook elementary school on 1214 2012. you see that Yes. Right. Have we been able to locate a copy of the sign-in log? No. Do you know whether or not the sign-in log was placed on the traffic sign by the town of Newton? It was not. Right. Was it ever given to the town of Newton? It was not. No further questions. So there's, let me understand this, there's a sign-in, there's, a, there's a, a sign, a flashing sign that says, everyone must check in, but the town didn't put it there. Who do you think put it there? I believe Homeland Security put it there. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, okay. Now, let's go back to the question regarding... Well, hang on a second. I, I think the response from Mr. Housing is completely mm -hmm. correct. There's no evidence whatsoever that the first elected, who's here voluntarily, 
All right, so very interesting. Why would she say Homeland Security? Right, unless she was working with them in some capacity. And yeah. and right after that, the lawyer kind of clamps down and says, oh, this is a, we can't go here, this line of questioning. Or he didn't like the outburst that that Wolfgang made like when he said thank you. You know, well, because if, if the town doesn't have it, then Homeland Security must have it. And so I guess that's where he'll go next to well, see what Homeland Security Only, only time will tell. I, I think what was very interesting to me was small world, because come to find out, and you, you probably weren't aware of this until after the fact, uh, after the fact, but you had a family member that was there, someone that was former Navy SEALs, former FBI. Mm -hmm. You said that he recognizes BS when he sees it. Right. Uh, what was his thoughts on the hearing? All right, so I get a picture from Dan Bedondi was there uh, mm -hmm. covering the whole event, and then he texts me a picture, and he's standing next to my uncle, my mm -hmm. dad's older brother, and uh, I'm like, what the heck? This is, what? How, how, did, how is Dan Bedondi standing next to my uncle? Yeah. I text him back, and uh, so... This morning, I actually talked to my uncle, and um, he he said, out of all the court cases he's ever sat in, he's retired FBI. Mm -hmm. He worked in New York City. Been there, done right. that. Yeah. He was putting mob guys away. Sure. Uh, or helping, at least, or, you know, investigating. And, um, you know, he said, out of all the court cases he's ever seen, or this was the weirdest one of all time. He said, these people in this small town don't know anything about this event. That's supposedly the biggest event in their history, and they have no paper trail. There's no paper trail for anything, which he said just boggles him. He said it was the strangest thing he's ever seen. And actually, uh, Dan did a real short interview with him after that. He doesn't talk a lot. He is very mm -hmm. reserved. But he did tell me this. He said he went up there because a friend of his said, you got to go up there and check this out. There's something weird going on in Sandy Hook. Because he knew nothing about any of this, of you know what we know and what we've been uh, talking about here mm -hmm. at Infowars, uh, you know, he just kind of took the the byline from the media, you know, whatever they said, he he just went with it. But then when he went up there, he said, "There's no reason for all this secrecy. If if you know, if they want this to go away, just pass out the documents." So here's a quick uh, interview from him. I guess Dan interviewed him and asked him a couple questions. All right, but Dondi. And uh, what do you think? Uh, you witnessed the whole hearing here. Was you here last time too? No, no. No, but being here today, what did you think of the whole thing? Very strange. Yeah. Very strange. Very strange situation. Yes. Yeah, no, so what do you expect to come out of this? You think they're going to try to cover this up or is this going to go anywhere? I really don't know. I've never seen anything like this yeah. before. <coughs> yeah, and it's uh, great to have you guys come out here and support this because you know, we have a tyranny is being done right now and justice is being done at the same time. So we got to stick on the right side of history. So that was Dan Bedondi there on the ground at the hearing in Connecticut. And I want to flash back real quick to a Connecticut State Police news conference. This was shortly after the tragedy. And I, you probably remember this. They were warning people not to post any bogus information about Sandy Hook on social media or else. One thing that's uh, becoming somewhat of a concern, and that is misinformation that's being posted on social media sites. These issues are crimes. They will be investigated statewide and federally, and prosecution will take place when people perpetrating this information are identified. So that was a distant early warning for, I guess, Sandy Hook conspiracy theorists, if you will. They didn't want anybody posting and talking about this on social media. They want to control right. the narrative. It kind of reminds me of what happened with the Boston bombing, where the FBI got up and said, don't look at any other pictures except the one we're posting exactly. here right. of these two guys with black backpacks, even though one of them didn't have a black backpack. He had a Nothing gray backpack. Nothing to see. Nothing and, to see. And then, yet there's <laughs> pictures of, you know... 20 other people in the crowd holding yeah. black backpacks. And if you ask questions, you day. you are dishonoring the victim's family. Yeah, family anytime you ask questions yeah. about anything, you know, and, and Wolfgang's whole thing, why he was going into this is, how do we not make this happen again? If this is a real tragedy, what do we do to prevent it from happening? Exactly, and he's just asking normal questions right. that anybody else would ask, and it's just very odd that a lot of these average normal questions are being blocked. Right, and what turned on, what, what really got his radar off is when the Florida state troopers came to his house and said, yeah, that's right. Don't be asking questions. Right. Well, what are you doing? You know, keep your mouth shut. So that set off red flags for him. And I think anybody, and, and with his background, he, he that probably sent that spidey sense tingling. Sure. So from here on out, it looks like there's gonna be a third hearing now because they didn't finish all the information with this hearing. Yeah. 
Uh, Dan Badani actually went and confronted the uh, uh, police chief who incidentally retired recently. He just, mm. Chief Kehoe, he just retired. And um, so he went out and confronted him and he confronted the lawyer also who's uh, working with him. So very interesting stuff going on in Sandy Hook. And it looks like we still have more questions than answers each time we ask for a freedom of information request. There's always more questions at the end instead of getting the answers that, that you would think be there in normal situations. So there you go. Wow. So, well, stay tuned, folks, because I'm sure we're going to have Hal Big back on the show soon to give us his take on all this on the latest hearing and when the next one is going to be. Meanwhile, we're going to wrap this up right now. That's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. InfoWars Nightly News will return, Lord willing, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time, Texas time, that is. Until then, have a blessed evening. We'll see you back right here tomorrow night.